Uh, I'm Tom Mesereau, and uh, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce our speaker, Annette Myers. Annette is unquestionably one of the most accomplished, one of the most awarded prosecutors in the country. She's a graduate of the University of California, San Diego, and Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C. She's been with the L.A. County DA's office her whole career, beginning as a clerk, and she has risen to the top. She was the first female African-American president of the Los Angeles County Bar Association. She chaired the first diversity summit conducted by the Los Angeles County Bar Association. She's received all kinds of awards, prosecutor of the year twice. She's been named as the top, among the top 100 most influential lawyers in the state of California. She's been very active in this bridge between the Los Angeles County Bar Association and the State Bar Association, which regulates lawyers in California. Uh, numerous awards there. She's had close to 200 jury trials, death penalty trials. She's prosecuted some of the highest profile cases in Los Angeles County. She's had supervisory roles at various courthouses in LA County. She uh, has been part of very specialized units in that office. For example, uh, people who shoot sheriffs and police officers, she's prosecuted them. She prosecuted one of the first uh, serial killers and convicted him with DNA evidence. Uh, this is a very, very accomplished prosecutor, uh, a very, very accomplished lawyer, and uh, we're really lucky to have her, and uh, my pleasure to introduce Jeanette Myers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about uh, three things, three areas. First, alternatives to incarceration. And that's a really interesting topic now, hot button topic, because of AB 109, which has come down the pike now, uh, which is sort of the realignment of sentencing caused by the overcrowding in the Department of Corrections, which has pretty much trickled down to the county jail level. And all of this uh, was started by the United States Supreme Court when the United States Supreme Court mandated that the state of California release approximately 40,000 prisoners within the Department of Corrections as a result of overcrowding. Uh, and overcrowding exists both in the Department of Corrections as well as the county jail level. If you don't believe me, take a tour of the LA County Jail and you'll see it's, it's really um, quite unfortunate that when you get incarcerated, both at the state and the county level, that the living conditions are the way they are. Uh, they really should not uh, be that way. Uh, just because you're incarcerated doesn't mean that you have to be treated inhumanely. And quite frankly, if you go into both the county jail, and I've been in the county jail in a couple of uh, state prisons, you really see that uh, what the United States Supreme Court did was truly needed in the state of California. And what that's caused really is it's caused prosecutors and judges uh, and those in the criminal justice system to look at alternatives to incarceration. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that first, and then I'm going to talk about when you need a lawyer uh, from my perspective. Uh, my perspective may be a little different than some defense attorneys' perspectives, but just to give you an overview of prosecutors and when we believe you need a lawyer. And quite frankly, personally, I believe every time you come into the criminal justice system and you are charged with an offense, you may not want to pay for a lawyer, but it surely uh, is to your advantage to seek legal guidance anytime you are charged with a crime. So I'll talk about that, uh, I'll, I'll finish talking about that, and then I'll take any questions that you may have about the criminal justice system. And then I'll, I'll briefly talk a little bit about what happens when you uh, are exposed to the criminal justice system either as a defendant or as a victim in the rights that you have, okay? So let's talk first about alternatives uh, to incarceration. Let me take misdemeanors first. And uh, misdemeanors are those crimes uh, where uh, the maximum penalty is a year in the county jail. So if it's, a, it's a, if it's a charge where the maximum is a year in the county jail and there is no state prison sentence associated with it, that's a straight misdemeanor. Now there are crimes that are called wobblers uh, in our system and those are crimes where they're not strikes, uh, they're not serious or violent felonies, you can get a misdemeanor sentence, but you can also get a state prison sentence. And usually that state prison sentence is 16 months, two years, or three. Okay. So let's just talk about misdemeanors first. So let's say you're charged, you go into Target, and you decide, you know, I'm going to pick something up, and I don't really have the money to pay for it, and I just want to see if I can get away with it. Okay. 
And so you go and you, you walk out of the store and the loss prevention officer comes up to you and says, hey, you know, you took some property from Target. Well now, Target will prosecute you aggressively. Uh, it used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago, many of the retail stores would say, you know, we'll take the loss, we'll take the property, and we'll let you go. We'll uh, deal with you civilly. Now they don't do that. Now every time you walk out of a department store with something, and it could be something that's, you know, cost five bucks, guess what? Police are going to come, they're going to arrest you, you're going to get charged with an offense. Probably a misdemeanor, 44. Uh, if you've got a booster bag or something, they may charge you with a misdemeanor uh, second degree burglary. Okay. When that happens, uh, there are two agencies that are likely to prosecute you, either the city, a city attorney's office of that particular mis municipality or the DA's office. The DA's office prosecutes misdemeanors in 78 of the 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles. Okay. The others are prosecuted by local uh, city attorney's office. In the city of Los Angeles, that means the city, not the county, and people get that mixed up, the city of Los Angeles has its own city attorney's office, and the city attorney prosecutes those misdemeanors. Those agencies handle how they're going to prosecute those cases in various ways. Okay? So in the district attorney's office, when you have that kind of a misdemeanor, some DAs may say, you know what, I want you to go sit in jail for 10 days. Now that's changed. Okay? Now we have alternatives. To that. What's the alternative to that? Well, first of all, one of the alternatives to incarceration, so if you ever find yourself in that predicament, or when you've been practicing law, for those of you who are law students, uh, you can say, how about full restitution to Target? Full restitution for Target, and maybe a year probation, because it may take you a year to pay off that restitution, and after that, the case is dismissed. So my client doesn't have to do any time in custody. That's an alternative to incarceration. Probation, summary probation. The other thing is, my client can't pay it off, but my client will do some community service. And so if you're in that predicament and your lawyer doesn't really know what to do, you say to your lawyer, can I do a little community service as opposed to being incarcerated in the county jail for that offense? That's an alternative to incarceration. Community service is there are various types of community service. The toughest types are beach cleanup and cow trash. They're real tough uh, because nobody wants to go out on the freeway and pick up trash. And they will, you, you, you have to pay for that community service, in addition to which Caltrans requires that you do it eight hours a day. And it's eight hours of manual labor. It is not easy. As opposed to community service where you can go to a nonprofit agency, such as where we are today, and you could probably uh, do it two, three hours a day you know, for a week or two weeks. So, or you could do the Museum of Tolerance, which I like to have people do, uh, or you can do the morgue or the coroner's office. And those two, the morgue and the coroner's office, are two types of community service that sometimes we mandate when people are stopped for driving under the influence of alcohol. Okay? <coughs> or if you're under the influence of something and you're driving. Because what we want to impart to most people is, it's dangerous to do that, and this is the effect of what happens when you go to the morgue and you do your community service there. You see what can happen? Okay. So it's really beneficial to you. That's also an alternative to incarceration. Now, let's say you're charged with being under the influence as a misdemeanor, commonly referred to as Health and Safety Code Section 11550. And Health and Safety Code Section 11550 has a, a provision in it where there is mandated jail time. But we can always get around that. Uh, prosecutors can get around anything we want to get around, which is one of the reasons I like being a prosecutor, because <laughs> prosecutors don't always have to go and beg. Uh, you guys come to us uh, and say, what can you do for us? And we can do a whole lot. Uh, so, and, and if you're a compassionate prosecutor, like I like to think that I am, I always find reasons to see if I can get around so that I can help your particular predicament. Because I come from a community, so I understand that it's difficult for most people to get up in the morning. I get that. Um, every day, the everyday uh, toils are just very difficult for some people. I understand that. Uh, so uh, I have all the cards in my pocket, and I'm able to really kind of ment out justice where I see it's appropriate in certain circumstances. 11550s are one of those cases. So you have an 11550, and your lawyer comes to you and says, look, you've got to be on probation. You, gotta, you might have to go to the county jail for 90 days. And you say, look, I just got this job. Just got this job. If I'm gone for that amount of time, I'm losing that job. Can you help me out? 
If you're that defense attorney, there are many options you can say to the prosecutor. One, can my client do a number of NA or AA meetings as opposed to being in jail? Okay. Or can my client have an outpatient program, an outpatient <coughs> treatment program? Many of, you'll find that many employers now, as part of their insurance packages, will allow you to go to outpatient treatment programs and they will pay for it. I believe Kaiser has one. Uh, but so, so you really need to look into that and say to your clients, or for those of you who are here who've had those predicaments, does my insurance carrier do this? You come to the prosecutor and say, look, my client will do 60 NA meetings, my client will do an outpatient program, and my pro client will do community service. If you allow my client to do that instead of incarceration, we've got a deal. Those are alternatives to incarceration because what incarceration may do is it may unfortunately keep you in to the point where you do lose your job. And if you lose your job, we know it's a trickle down effect. You lose your job, you lose your house, uh, you lose your family. Uh, so it's really important when you're charged with certain offenses that you understand there are some alternatives. It's just the regular close the door to the county jail. Uh, there's also uh, something that I've seen that happens. And one of the things that I like to do, especially when I'm talking to younger kids, uh, and I call them younger kids, but they're adults in the adult system. They come in at the age of 18, 19, or 20, and they do really stupid things. So the first thing I say to their lawyers is I, said, I say, are they in school? What are they doing? Are they on the streets just creating nonsense? Or are they in school? Get them in school and come back to me. Okay, and I've done this on a number of cases, both misdemeanor and felonies. If you're in school and you're productive, I'm not going to say that person has to go to county jail. I'll put you on probation. You finish school. You come back. Probation is terminated. Okay, those are alternatives that you can impart to the prosecutor. Those are things that you yourselves can say to your lawyers. Look, can you see if the prosecutor will work with me and you know let allow me to finish school? Because uh, you'd be surprised at how many of our young people come into the criminal justice system who are really actually in school and they do stupid things uh, and it can impact your schooling. Misdemeanors and felonies have a direct impact on what you do in life, but particularly felonies. Uh, misdemeanors, I say, those misdemeanors that are priorable, they stay on your record. When you pick up another offense, we use those misdemeanors to enhance your sentences because we say to ourselves, look, you got a chance here, you had a misdemeanor, you didn't do any jail time, now you're back in the criminal justice system again, I'm going to give you a little more time than I would ordinarily give a first-time offender. So don't let anyone ever tell you that a misdemeanor is not that serious on your record. It is serious if it's a priorable offense, and I'm talking about 484s, 10851s, which are joy writings, 11550s are priorable if you pick up two or three and increases the term that you do in the county jail. Uh, all of those things have impacts on your lives, okay? Um, there's also something called a civil compromise, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Civil compromises are in the penal code, and we used to do them, when I first started out in the DA's office 25 years ago, we used to do civil compromises all the time on certain cases. So uh, if you had a vandalism case or if you had a hit and run, we kind of saw those like, you know, there's a hit and run. The gravamen of the offense is really the damage done to the car. Uh, you know, a little bit of you shouldn't have, you know, run away from the accident. But the gravamen of really the offense was, was the damage to the car, the property damage, uh, or the personal damage to the victim. And so what we would do under 1377 and 1378 of the penal code is we would civilly compromise these cases. That has gone by the wayside. We, the DA's office doesn't civilly compromise cases. Sometimes the city attorney's office will civil, civilly compromise cases, and I've seen that happen at the airport. Normally happens on hit and runs and vandalisms. Their policy, I know, is, is not to and to object on the record. Some judges will allow those civil compromises, so the judges on their own motion will say on hit and runs or vandalism cases and sometimes petty theft cases, you know what, I'm going to civilly compromise those cases under that particular section of the penal code. And what that means is that you come into court, you pay full restitution to the victim, and the case is dismissed. That's a civil compromise. Go in and ask for it. You're probably going to hear no. You can beg the judge for it if you're a defense attorney and say, look, my client has no record. My client was pretty stupid when they hit this person, uh, and, and, and they were scared at the time, and they ran away from the accident. Can we civilly compromise that? Civil compromises require the victim, of course, to come into court and say, OK, that's fine with me. Uh, and so when that kind of thing happens, that's an alternative to incarceration. It's also an alternative to having your client have, be a place on probation. 
Uh, because being placed on probation requires that uh, you complete probation. If you violate probation, you could, in fact, go to the county jail. <coughs> uh, uh, other things could happen. So civil compromises in the past used to be great uh, for the DA's office. They don't do it anymore. Some cities do it. Check into that uh, alternative to incarceration. Uh, there's also live-in drug treatment programs. If your client has um, just a, an enormous drug problem, and uh, if your client has several DUIs, uh, misdemeanor DUIs, the thing about the DUIs is that the law mandates that you serve a certain period of time depending on how many that you have. But you can kind of get around a little bit of that by saying, because it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, chunk of time, the minimums, they would have the mandatory minimums they'd have to serve. But you know, as you all know, you go into the county jail, if you get 30 days in county jail, as we've recently seen with Lizzie Lohan, you walk out in about five hours. Now, you may not walk out in five hours, but if you get a 30-day sentence or a 60-day sentence in county jail, you're probably going to do about 20% of that time now. And you may do even less depending on the population within the jail. So if the population is too much when the day you go in, um, it violates the federal mandate on the, the county jail system, the least violent offenders get kicked loose first. So you may do less than 20% of the time, OK? Um, if that happens, uh, there's still a big chunk of time the judge can give you. You can say uh, to the prosecutor, how about if my client, who's picked up his third DUI, the fourth becomes a felony, but he's at the third DUI, he or she, can that particular person have a live-in drug treatment program? OK? Those are really good, because I often say if they're going into a living drug treatment program, it's going to help them. I will, I can live with that. Okay. The problem with living drug treatment programs is they're few and far between in this society. But AB 109 is going to probably help a little bit of that because it's going to be they're going to be starting to require service providers to have those kinds of things. Uh, and we as a society uh, need to uh, see if we can pull more money into having more of those programs uh, because they they really are beneficial. They're more beneficial, I believe, than giving someone 90 days in the county jail. Because 90 days in the county jail will only dry you out. It's not going to cure the problem. A living drug treatment program is going to cure, at least help you with your problem. Those living drug treatment programs can go anywhere from 6 to, to 12 months. Normally speaking, they're about 9 months down the line. And they really are beneficial to people who really, really have drug problems. So that's another alternative to incarceration that you should really look into. Uh, and an enrollment into the military. Uh, a lot of times people go ahead and they enroll in the military. And they come in and they say, you know what, my client uh, has just enrolled in the military, what will you do? Uh, to me, uh, that's an important thing. If they're enrolled in the military, we can work something out. Because uh, that's really a very important aspect of our society. And if you're willing to go ahead and be disciplined and go into the military for two years, I think I can look at maybe doing something, uh, a reduction in sentence or something less than incarceration. So that's another aspect for those people uh, in the military. Now, certain vehicle code violations um, that mandate um, incarceration, uh, driving on a suspended license, things of that nature, depending on where you are in the county, those things are treated differently. So just know this, that if you are picked up for driving without a license, which is a violation of Vehicle Code Section 12500, and you don't have your license, if you come into some courts, what will happen is the DA or the city attorney will say, can you get your license? Because if you can get your license, we put the matter over. And if you come back, we'll either dismiss it or there's an infraction that they may make you plead to for not having your driver's license. So, when you're dealing with vehicle code violations, they're very different than if you're dealing with penal code section violations. Again, if, you, if, you, if your client comes in and they have a driving on a suspended license, typically that's a violation of uh, vehicle code section uh, 14500. If that happens, they don't have any priors. Normally what happens is the DA says they can plead to a 12500. Okay? If they have a license, they can plead to a 12500. And we may or may not put them on probation which means it's sort of a freebie because the 12500 becomes, then becomes an infraction. So it's really a, a, a sort of a, a, a nothing kind of a, a violation. So those are the kind of things that you can think about when you go into the court system 
and you think to yourself, you know what, do I really need a lawyer uh, for these kinds of offenses? And I say, yeah, you do. Just talk to a lawyer because you can get reductions. You can get probation, summary probation for a minimum period of time of like a year, uh, maybe minimum fines. So think about all of that. Those are all, uh, in my uh, estimation, alternatives to incarceration and alternatives to uh, reductions in, in charges that uh, prosecutorial agencies will, will uh, charge. And normally we charge the highest of what we can do. So if, if there's something out there that's, that's, um, uh, that we deem to be sort of a lesser offense, it's usually not charged that way. The, the higher offense is usually charged, and we sort of reduce it down when we get to the arraignment or the pretrial. So just know that. So let's talk, talk about, uh, also, there are two other things. There's electronic monitoring that you can you can look at, but that's very, very costly, and there is, um, you know, house arrest. Those things are very costly. Uh, so, you know, I say to people, they're alternatives, but they're costly alternatives. You've got to pay for electronic, uh, electronic monitoring, and it's not cheap. So let's talk about felony cases. Uh, and those are, felonies are extremely important because they will affect you for the rest of your life. They are on your record for the rest of your life. Even though they get expunged, and we'll talk a little bit about expungement, sometimes when you go and you seek employment and your employer will say to you, have you ever been arrested <coughs> and charged with a felony offense? And have you ever been convicted of a felony offense? And has that offense been expunged from your record? Even though it has been expunged, there are certain felonies that you have to say, yes, I was convicted, and that was, was expunged from my record. And employers will look at you in a very different light than that person who doesn't have that felony conviction on their record. So, uh, and particularly if you have a felony and then you're sent to state prison, uh, it's not going to get expunged on your record. It's going to be on your record. So, what you want to do if you're charged with a felony, the first thing you want to do is you want to see if you can get that reduced to a misdemeanor. Uh, you want to see, first of all, if you can get it dismissed. If you didn't do it, you want to get it dismissed. But if you think in your mind, you know, probably the evidence is probably going to show that I did in fact do it, you want to see if you can get it reduced to a misdemeanor, or at the very least, you want to see if I can put up, get on probation without having to serve time in either state prison or the county jail. If you have a prior felony record, okay, uh, if it's a non-serious offense to which you're being charged, and you don't have a strike on your record, now with AB 109, you're probably not going to state prison. Your alternative is going to be that you're going to serve that time in the county jail. And if the prosecutor says, I want you to go to state prison on this case, you're still going to county jail, but it's going to be deemed a state prison prior. What you want to do so that your client doesn't have to go to county jail is you want to say to the prosecutor, look, is this somebody you want to take up, that you want to take up a bed in either county jail or state prison? How about we do this? How about we give some state prison suspended time, okay, give my client another chance, and these are, these are things that I don't like. I don't like state prison suspended time, but it's out there, so I'm going to talk about it. And that means that the judge will impose state prison time, but it's going to be suspended. Give my client some suspended uh, state prison time, put my client on probation, and let my client do some community service and pay back the restitution to the victim. Always an alternative. Okay, so that way it saves your client uh, jail time, saves that client's job, saves that client uh, problems with their family, saves that client's house, alternative to incarceration. Okay, so think about that. There's always community service. You can say, look, instead of going to the county jail, and let's say your client is charged with forgery. Client goes into the bank, client signs a, a check that's counterfeit, the bank doesn't recognize it, the client gets away with about a thousand bucks, charged with a felony offense. Okay, you say to the prosecutor, first time offense, uh, can my client be put on probation, uh, can my client pay the amount back, full restitution to the bank, and do some community service. And that's pretty much the standard disposition. That's a good disposition because at the conclusion of that probationary period of time, conclusion of the three years, um, your client can have that reduced to a misdemeanor and dismissed. And that's really, really important. The other aspect, too, that you need to note is that probation, felony probation, one of the things I, I like to urge uh, defense attorneys to ask the judge to do with felony probation, and I'll do it in some cases um, as well, particularly with people who are homeless. Um, 
and people who, are, who don't have the money to pay for the cost of probation services. Uh, the cost of probation services, incredibly high, $4,000, $5,000. But if you put a person on formal, non-reporting probation, they don't have the cost of probation services. So sometimes lawyers will say to me, can my client have probation, full restitution to the victim, but non-reporting probation because my client cannot pay the cost of probation services? I'll say yes, because the cost is so high. Now you, see, you may say to yourself, well, why is that so important? Well, it's important in two aspects. One, if you don't pay the cost of probation services at the conclusion of your probation, many judges will not grant you that expungement, that reduction <coughs> in dismissal. They're not going to grant it because you haven't fulfilled your, your requirements under probation, which is the cost of probation services and paying all your fines and fees. So that's a problem. The second problem is if you don't pay the cost of probation services, at the conclusion of your probation, before the last day is up, probation comes in and they say to the judge, they haven't paid the cost of probation services, we would like you to impose a judgment, a judgment uh, for the record so probation can go back and collect those costs civilly. If that happens, that's on your credit rating. If you want to buy a house down the line, that's on your credit. Uh, if you want to get a credit card, that's on your credit report. It impacts you greatly. So that's the reason why the cost of probation services is so important. Um, I always look at defense attorneys when they don't, they don't think of that kind of thing that happens to most people because they're not in that situation. But a lot of defense attorneys will tell the judge, okay, fine, just, Im just impose the judgment. And I say to them, you really want this to happen? I would rather you have the judge extend probation out another year so that they can see if they can pay it as opposed to putting that judgment on their record because that's going to impact whether or not they can buy a house, get credit, go to school, what have you. It has long-term ramifications. And let's face it, the way we are at the age of 20 is not the way we are at the age of 40. And so you may think that that's a, okay at 20, but down the line somewhere, you're going to want a family, you're going to want to buy a house, you want to get credit, you want to go to school. All of those things impact you now. They didn't 25 years ago. I don't think 25 years ago when I decided to go to college, or 30 years ago, that my credit report was run by the University of California. Uh, now, everybody runs your credit report. And if they see something on your credit report, guess what? You're not going to get that job. And if they see a judgment, they may not give you that job. So think about those things uh, as, as you go into the criminal justice system and as you, either as a lawyer, as a victim, or as a defendant, the, all of those things are important for you to think about. Um, so you, you still have the same kinds of, of, of alternatives to incarceration. If you're charged with drug offenses, uh, at the felony level, and even at the misdemeanor level, um, there is always Prop 36. There's always um, uh, diversion, uh, drug diversion. Uh, and there's something called drug court, and now they have something called veterans court. Uh, so, and those particularized courts will really help you. Uh, they will not automatically, the judges there will, and the DAs and the PDs will not automatically send you to county jail. They have a lot of programs set up uh, in those courts to help you. Um, you can also, there's also something called the regional center. If your client has some emotional problems, uh, the regional center is all, always an alternative. There's also an alternative if your client is not 1368, so to speak, meaning there's, you declare doubt about their competency, but there are some mental, underlying mental issues with your client. You can always ask that your client go into a dual diagnostic program to treat those, as opposed to being incarcerated in the county jail and felony offenses and people are always open to that. What you have to do is you have to back that up with some doctor's report, which is, should be very easy to do. Uh, you ask the court to appoint someone to take a look at your client. Uh, those are always alternatives to uh, state prison and county jail, so think about those. Uh, finally, if your client has some adversity to going to county jail, if you have a case where the DA and the judge says, no, you know what, county jail, and your client or you particularly say, you know what, I cannot go into the to LA County jail system. I just can't do it. There's also city jails. So you can pay to go to a city jail. But those are people who have the means, the money to do that. And sometimes the city jails will allow you to come in and do eight hours and then leave or come in after you work, spend the night at the, the city jail. The two things you gotta remember there, you're gonna do all of your time, so you're gonna do about 100% of the time, so if you get 90 days, you're going to do the 90 days in the city jail, and you're going to have to pay. And sometimes the city jails are over $100 a day. 
So if you've got that kind of money, I don't know, most people don't have that kind of money, that's an alternative uh, to incarceration in the county jail, okay? Know now that with AB 109 and realignment coming down the pike, not everybody is going to the Department of Corrections. So you go generally to the Department of Corrections if you get a sentence, if you've got a prior strike, that means a violent or serious felony, or if the underlying case that, sh that you're in court with is a violent or serious felony. Uh, a robbery with use of a firearm, uh, of course we know murder, you're always going to state prison. Uh, things of that nature that I'm talking about. Any, any, any offense where you use a discharge a firearm, you're probably going to the Department of Corrections. Uh, so what you're going to see probably in the next five to ten years as we transition into this kind of alternative sentencing approach is you're going to see really the really serious offenders in the Department of Corrections, which is the way it truly should be. And then the nonviolent offenders, there are going to be alternatives for them, particularly the nonviolent drug offenders. Those alternatives are going to be uh, outpatient drug treatment programs with a, maybe a little bit of county jail time. Um, and you're not going to see people on parole a lot. Uh, that's just not going to happen for nonviolent offenders uh, for a long period of time. You're going to see a lot of mixed sentences. OK, you can do a little bit of county jail time, but we want you on probation too, because we want you to pay restitution in cases. So there's, a mix, there's going to be a lot of mixing and matching. But the good thing is you're going to, it's, it's a really good time for us to find a lot of alternatives to just throwing people in prison and throwing the key away. Okay. So that's really uh, the, what I wanted to impart to you today about alternatives to sentencing. Uh, and because there are many now that you can, you can choose from, uh, either as uh, an attorney or as if you're unfortunately in the criminal justice system being a charged offender. Now what happens when you, uh, next issue, what happens when you get caught up in the, in the criminal justice system? And how do you get caught up in the criminal justice system? Well, as I drive around Los Angeles, um, what bothers me the most is I see young men and women, and most, I, I can tell you the majority of the time it's young men who get in cars, who commit traffic violations that are so obvious to me that I know the police sitting on the corner see them. And unfortunately, in their cars, they may have marijuana or cocaine. It's sort of like, catch me if you can. And I just shake my head all the time because it makes it so easy for you to get prosecuted. It's just so easy. You're just sort of asking for it. Because once you get stopped for a traffic violation, uh, you can better believe that the police are going to take you out of the car. You can better believe they're going to search the car. Um, and if they find drugs, you're going to get arrested. That's a, that's a given. Right? And depending on the amount of drugs that they find depends upon whether I see you in felony court or whether you're down in the misdemeanor court or whether you get to go home. Because if it's a de minimis amount, de minimis amount you're probably going to go home. They, with a, an infraction for whatever vehicle code violation that you committed. But if it's a large amount, I'm going to see you in the felony court. And at that point in time, you're in the criminal justice system. And what do you do? How do you avoid it? Well, first of all, you avoid coming and seeing me in the criminal justice system if, number one, you're smart about who your friends are and you're smart about what you have in your car and who you have in your car. Okay? If you got drugs in your car, if you decide you want to go out, speed down the street, do yourself a favor. Take the drugs out of the car. Okay? Just take them out of the car because you're going to get stopped. But unfortunately, people don't think. And when they don't think, they're in the criminal justice system. You got drugs in your car. Do yourself a favor and get a lawyer. Do not come into court thinking, you know what, I can handle this. Do not come into court thinking the cop was wrong. You may feel that the cop is wrong, and you may say, I'm going to fight this on my own. Do yourself a favor. Don't do it. Why not? Because I guarantee you, the prosecutor at the other end of the table is smarter than you are. The prosecutor at the other end of the table has dealt with this time and time again. And if you're not a lawyer yourself, you're going to get torn apart. You're going to get beat up. You want to know what your alternatives are. And so I don't care if you feel the public defender, if you can't afford a lawyer, if you feel, you know, because I've looked at television, and I don't think any public defender is smart. Trust me, they are smart. They're lawyers. They know what they're doing. They do it on a daily basis, and they will take a look at your case. You may have drugs in your car, but the stop may be illegal. And if the stop is illegal, guess what? The case is going away. But you're not going to know that the stop is illegal because you're not a lawyer. 
And so don't do yourself any favors by saying to yourself, guess what, I'm gonna handle this on my own because I'm so upset at that cop, I'm gonna show that cop, no, that cop and that DA are gonna show you. Please, 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 please. When you come into the felony arena, make sure you have a lawyer. And if you cannot afford one, the state provide one, provides one for you. And the lawyers that are in the courtroom are no dummies. They know what they're doing. So if there's anything you take from me today, you take that from me, okay? If you come in as a victim, okay, there are certain rights that you have. And I, I always like to take one of these pamphlets around and make sure that people uh, understand their rights as victims. Because we in both uh, the African American community, the Latino community, the Asian American community, uh, we are victims too. We really are. And people a lot of times don't think that uh, we're entitled to the same rights that people in other communities, wealthy communities are. Guess what? You are. You're entitled to respect. And one of the things that really kind of puts it all together and codifies it all is, is Marcy's Law. Uh, and Marcy's Law tells, the, fir the first thing about Marcy's Law tells you as a victim that you're to be treated with fairness and respect, with dignity. And just because you may be unemployed, you may be homeless, you're a victim. And you should, when you walk into court, you should be treated with dignity and respect. If you're not treated with dignity and respect, we're violating Marcy's law, and you need to make that known, okay? Uh, you're entitled to be protected by the person who hurt you. Uh, so if you don't want that person to know anything about you, like your address and stuff, you're entitled to that protection under the law. And if somebody decides that they don't want to honor that, you tell them Marcy's law is there and I'm entitled to it. And I don't care what your stature in life is, you are entitled to that. Uh, you're entitled to restitution. You're entitled to refuse to be interviewed uh, by anyone. If you don't want to be interviewed by the defense attorney, uh, if you want to have the prosecutor or someone of your family there to interview you when the defense attorney wants to interview you, you need to make those uh, items known. Marcy's Law allows you to do that, uh, okay? You're also entitled to reasonable notice. Uh, when the case is going to be in court. So the prosecutor has to tell you, guess what? Your case is being adjudicated today. You have the right to be there. You have the right to say something at sentencing. You have that absolute right. Uh, if somebody hurts a family member, you have to come into court and say, you know what? This is how it impacted me in my life. You have that right. Don't let anyone tell you you don't have that right. If, in fact, that case is heard without you being notified, you need to call the prosecutor prosecutor's office up and say, you violated Marcy's law. I have that right. I should have been heard. Uh, and I have the right to come to court. You have the right to, to be in court to object to a sentence. You know, if I'm giving the courthouse away in your estimation on a case where you were really hurt, you have the right to come in and say, I disagree with the sentence the prosecutor has offered to the defense attorney. I want more. Okay? So those are your rights under Marcy's law as a victim. So if unfortunately you end up in the criminal justice system as a victim, please know what your rights are. Uh, as defense attorneys, you also should know that, guess what, at the time of sentencing, your client has the right to say something. Your client's family members have the right to come up and say something. I mean, I just experienced that the other day in a case that was uh, profiled in the LA Times, uh, where, uh, I don't know if many of you read about it, the young man from Crenshaw High School uh, who uh, was uh, convicted of killing uh, a witness's mother. Uh, and the case took, uh, the sentencing took about two hours. Half of the time, the uh, family members of Pamela Lark, who was the uh, witness's mother who was gunned down, uh, they had to get up and talk about how that affected their lives. Uh, she left three kids uh, who have no parents. And one, unfortunately, was 17 at the time, and she now has to raise herself. Her other two kids were a little older. But at the same time, uh, the defendant's family got up. And the defendant's family got up and basically said, look, I don't believe he committed this crime. He's a good kid. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm sad about this, uh, and hopefully one day he'll come home. So both sides have an opportunity to address their concerns at a sentencing hearing. Don't let anyone tell you you don't have the right to get up. The, the caveat is you have to be a family member, okay? So you can't just be a concerned citizen who walks into court and says, I, I want to talk about this. You have to be a family member. Otherwise, we'd be there all day, okay? So um, just to finish up, because I don't want to take too much more time, 
uh, I want to talk uh, principally about, so those are, the, those are the things that you should know when you come into the criminal justice system. I want to sort of end on when you think, when I believe uh, you should have a lawyer, when I think you should come into the criminal justice system and, and, and say, you know what, I want a lawyer. In misdemeanor cases, there are some misdemeanors, very, very few, where I would say you can come into court and you really don't need a lawyer. And if you ever go down to Metro Court, I used to supervise that courthouse. Um, there's a big division there, it's called the Arraignment Division. I think at the time I was there was Division 61. And every traffic violation uh, imaginable in the city of Los Angeles ended up in 61. Uh, and it was the arraignment court. Uh, and we had so many cases dealing with driving without a license, which were vehicle code sections 12500s. People just decided they, they made the California right turn, and they got stopped. And unfortunately, they left their driver's license at home, and they were charged with driving without a driver's license. Okay, They would come into court. They really didn't need an attorney because the judge would say, talk to the prosecutor. And I would say, come back in two days. If you've got your driver's license, we'll dismiss the case. Okay? Those are about the only kinds of cases that I can see. Those little infractions, or if you get picked up and you have less than an ounce of marijuana and it's sort of a $50 fine or $100 fine. In that entire penal code, which is about this thick, those are about the only kinds of cases imaginable that I can think you can walk into a courtroom and not have to have a lawyer. Everything else, you have to have a lawyer. Even petty thefts, because petty thefts are priorable. That means that if you pick up a second one, you can be charged with petty theft with a prior. And you can be charged with petty theft as a prior as a misdemeanor or as a felony offense. And so that underlined first 484, if you can get that reduced to like a trespass, a 602L, that's great. Because that's not priorable. But the only way you're going to get that reduced is if you yourself uh, have some legal training or if you get a lawyer to do it. And most public defenders will come to us or most uh, defense, private defense lawyers will come to us and say, on that first 484, can we give them an infraction or can we give them something less, so like a 602L, which is not priorable. When you walk in the felony court, the same thing applies. Uh, it may be the, the, the simplest of felonies. It may be the stupidest felony imaginable. But as I said before, it is important that you get a lawyer. Um, so take that with you. The other times I think that it's important that you have a lawyer. So if you're at home and all of a sudden police knock on your door and they say, uh, I have a search warrant and I want to search your house. Well, they're entitled if they have a search warrant to search your house. The next step is if they want to talk to you. And you think to yourself, well, I haven't done anything, OK? So sure, I want to talk to you. <laughs> well, you think about that for a moment, because it depends upon what they want to talk to you about. If they just want to ask you, you know, how's the sun outside? How are you feeling today? Sure, no problem. But if they want to talk to you about something that they found in your house, you might want to think, you know, I have that Fifth Amendment right, and you have a Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. You have a Sixth Amendment right to a lawyer. You might want to say to yourself, you know, we'll talk about that later when I, you, I talk to my lawyer, okay? I mean, you, these are things you, you really want to think about. As a prosecutor, I love it when people talk because I get all kind of information. And then when we're at trial, I'll be very honest with you, I'm looking at that police report saying, you know, said something different, and I can use what you said differently against you as you take the stand. So those are the kinds of things that, that uh, prosecutors love. But at, on a practical point, as I stand before you as a lawyer telling you, you need to think about those things. Do I want to say something? And it may not be that you're guilty, but think about this. You may have had 20 people in your house last night, OK? And you don't know what all 20 people were doing. Police come the next morning, and they serve a search warrant on your house. They go in for whatever reason, and they find a gun, and they find some, and, and the gun is not registered to you, and they find cocaine and marijuana and some other stuff. It may not be yours. Trust me, it may not be yours. You have no idea where it came from. But you're thinking, I had that party last night. 
and you may say something that incriminates you. So you want to think about those kinds of things um, that uh, may result in uh, some type of negative thing happening down the line as, as the police come in and then you're ultimately charged with an offense. Um, when you're stopped by the police for a traffic violation um, and they want to talk to you, they have the absolute right to talk to you. They want to ask you for your name and for your, your address and all of that. They can ask you for that. People ask me all the time, what about when they give me a ticket, do I have to sign? You're not incriminating yourself. You don't need a lawyer at that point. You have to sign the ticket because the ticket is not saying, you're not saying you're guilty. All the ticket does is say, is, is say uh, or reflects the fact that you have received this ticket. You're on notice that, guess what, you've committed this offense. Okay? So you don't need a lawyer for that aspect. But if the, the, the police find something in your car and they want to talk to you about what they found in the trunk of your car, Again, I remind you, you have a right to have a lawyer, so you have to think about it. Do I want to chat with the police about what they found in my car? If I don't know who it belongs to, if it is mine, how is that going to incriminate me later? Those are the kinds of things you want to think about. Uh, you may want to talk to the police. Uh, you may might want to say, you know what, that's not my stuff. Uh, I have no idea where that came from. Uh, or you may take the other approach, you know what, I have a right against self-incrimination. I want to talk to my lawyer before I talk to you. Uh, so think about those things. Uh, the only two, as again, as I said, the only two times that I think that a lawyer is probably not uh, necessary for you, when you go in without dri with driving without a license, 12500, uh, you probably don't need one uh, for those uh, kinds of uh, incidences because they're going to get reduced anyway. Okay? Any questions? Yes. I have a couple questions about the justice system, <laughs> about her career, about choices she's made. I think. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong to that, but I think that's That's okay. correct. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> Questions? AB 109 and uh, that Gibson's law, is that federal or is that just state of California? State of California. For both of them, AB 109 and? And Marcy's law, yes. Yeah. But, but you know what, a AB 109 is just something, uh, it's Assembly Bill 109, uh, and it just impacts the sentencing uh, uh, in the state of California. Marcy's law, a lot of states have a Marcy's law. You just go into different states and they'll have the same victims' rights things. They have them in all other states as well. They may not be called Marcy's law, they may be called something else. Any other questions? Thank you. Danette, we have, I'd like to ask you a question. Sure. Okay. We have lawyers and law students and college students who are taking a law school who donate their time generously to our clinic at least twice a month. And uh, for their benefit, why did you choose to be a career prosecutor? Well, it wasn't the money, I can say that. <laughs> uh, for a couple reasons. Um, I actually, for a very, very brief period of time, went into civil uh, and was a civil lawyer and uh, for about a year uh, with a, a boutique firm in Century City. And it really troubled me that uh, it was so important, money was so important to people, as opposed to liberty and what you could effectively do uh, in the community. And I, previous to that, I had been a, a law clerk in the DA's office, and I really saw what was important to people. Uh, so I got so tired of people squabbling over 100 bucks here, 1,000 bucks here. It was so ridiculous that I thought to myself, you know, one, I want to get trial experience, and I want to do something that's really relevant in, in my life and, and uh, something that I can feel proud of. So I went back to the DA's office. Prosecuting, unlike being a defense lawyer, you could really, I felt like I could really make a change. Because I grew up in Compton, and I saw what really transpired in the criminal justice system. I felt the, both the victims and the defendants, I kind of felt like what they were going through, I had experienced a lot of in my life. And I really felt like I could make a difference. I felt like I was something different. Uh, when people came into court, they would look at me and they'd feel more comfortable in my community. I spent five years in Compton, I can't tell you how many uh, defendants' parents came up and talked to me as opposed to the defense attorneys who didn't look like me or them. So you really, I, I really felt that, you know what, I really like what I'm doing because I'm really making a difference. Not a huge difference, but just a really a little difference, you know, in somebody's life. If I could kind of save and help somebody, that was great for me. I mean, I go home smiling at the end of the day because I really feel like I've done something. And it's not something big like our president would do, but it's something on a very small scale. Uh, so to me, Tom, I think the DA's office and the DA of LA County, uh, what we do impacts the lives of, of people in the community more so than what 
the legislature does in Sacramento and what Congress does in the United States Congress. We affect your lives on a daily basis. You walk down the street, you get hit over the head, I'm in your life. Uh, and I affect what happens to you uh, years down the road. So those are the reasons why I wanted to be a DA and I continue to be a DA. I, lo I love being, being in court too. Uh, trying cases, and I like seeing different defense attorneys. Uh, so it, it really, you know, it's a, it's a great, it really is a great job. So I know mean, a lot of people think, you know, I don't want to do it. I'd rather be a defense attorney because it's a lot more sexier. But actually, it's it's fun on our side of the aisle as well. Now, Danette, you you've been assigned in your career to different courthouses. I know you've been to Torrance, you've been to Compton, you've been to Bellflower downtown, Beverly Hills, the airport. Have you seen different approaches to prosecution at these various courthouses? And, and what I'm getting at is this. Uh, these courthouses service different parts of the county. Some are more affluent than other parts. Some have a different racial composition than other parts. Have you seen disparities in the way people are prosecuted that uh, might be linked to income or race? I think <laughs> that you do see disparities. Uh, I always say that if you come to the airport court, um, you're probably not going to go uh, into county jail or state prison as fast as you would in other areas of the county. Um, we actually called, uh, we, we have this funny phrase, it used to be 20 years ago, if you got picked up and tried a door walk, we used to call it no walk. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and I, I also see, I, I can tell you, I've had experience uh, in Compton uh, just dealing with, I, I was a county DA in Compton for five years. And Compton unique, has a unique situation because many of the crimes that are committed in Compton, some of them are so serious that um, the other crimes that are less serious go unnoticed because of the more serious crimes. And they may not get filed, uh, as opposed to if that crime was committed, let's say, in Long Beach or Torrance, that crime is going to get filed and you're going to get prosecuted severely for it. So. Uh, I have seen a disparity in how we, we, we charge crimes and how we adjudicate those crimes and some of the sentences that are imposed. Additionally, I mean, you know, you have so many serious crimes in a certain part of the county of Los Angeles. You have less serious crimes in other parts. So when those more serious crimes are committed in the, the parts of the county where they don't see those serious crimes, they are prosecuted vigorously and more vigorously in, let's say, other, than, let's say, other parts of the county. Additionally, jurors are a, a big impact on how prosecutors uh, prosecute cases. And I'll give you an example. When I was in the, the uh, unit of crimes against police officers, I prosecuted a defendant. Uh, this defendant had um, gone to his girlfriend's house, his ex-girlfriend's house, and decided he wanted to spend his birthday with her. She had a new boyfriend uh, and decided she did not want to spend his birthday with him. So he decided to go get three of his guns and he shot up the neighborhood. The police came. Uh, and he shot up at the police, and he, he uh, actually uh, hurt two of the police officers. So I charged him with 18 counts uh, stemming from attempted uh, murder on the police officers. He broke into the family. He uh, kidnapped uh, a couple of the kids. So he had 18 very serious felonies charged against him. Additionally, at that time, the new 12022.53b, the, the gun allegations, had come into play in California. And so it was a very new, and this was a case where we, we actually charged those, uh, those allegations. We didn't even have jury instructions for the allegations. I had to make up the jury instructions for those allegations. So I tried the case in Pomona. Well, Pomona is known as a court where you just don't walk. I mean, the jurors, you don't even need to uh, exercise a peremptory challenge. Uh, they're going to convict you. So the defense attorney, I had not tried a case in Pomona ever. And so the defense attorney um, said to me, you can pick the first 12 out the box. You know, meaning you're not gonna you're not gonna throw anybody off because they're gonna be all great jurors for the prosecution. I started laughing at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he was absolutely right. I was so embarrassed. I kicked one juror. Uh, the difference in that case was, and I was deathly ill at the time that I tried the case, uh, and I was so sick by the time I finished arguing it. I told the head deputy, I'm gonna go home, uh, and just call me if they have any questions. And he said, Go sleep in the library. The jury will be back in a number of, in a couple of hours. <laughs> and I said, Oh no, 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 they're 18 pounds. <laughs> Go sleep in the library, the jury back. Sure enough, two and a half hours, not one question, the jury came back, convicted on every count. Okay. That would not have happened at the airport, I guarantee you, because the jurors are a lot more liberal. And I'm not saying they're any less or more thoughtful. It's just their, 
they're, they don't, do they not always automatically believe that where there's smoke, there's fire. Um, and I think that there's a difference in perspective. So the way we handle cases out there at Pomona is a little different than the way you handle them at the airport. I mean, you think to yourself, can a jury at the airport convict on these charges? Maybe not, and maybe we'll give a reduction in, in charges. So it's very different throughout the county. I've worked Van Nuys, the same concept in Van Nuys. Uh, you try a gang case in Van Nuys, and you know, you got a jury verdict when you blink your eye. Uh, they don't like gangs. That's not to say that they don't like gangs in any other parts of the county, but I, I, I'm just telling you that the jury composition is very different. Uh, downtown, again, uh, a different composition of jurors, uh, a different way they look at cases and analyze cases. And that impacts how you charge cases and how you try them and what your offers are. From a social standpoint, <clears throat> we are the gang capital of America. I mean, the, the former police Commissioner Bill Bratton, who was the police chief in New York and Boston, told me that this gang problem is far worse than New York. Mm -hmm. Far deeper, far culturally, more culturally just embedded than New York. Um, and you've been prosecuting gang cases your whole career. From a social standpoint, what do you see as a solution to these problems? I think parenting is the biggest solution that we have possibly have. Uh, the reason we have gangs, uh, I think, in Los Angeles is because there is a lack of parenting, uh, tremendous lack of parenting on the part of, uh, of people in society. I know, and, and we don't have neighborhoods anymore like we used to have. When I was growing up, um, even if you didn't come from a two-parent home, uh, the neighbors watched out for each other. If, if you got in trouble, by the time you got home, your parents knew about it. Whether it was your father or your mother who was raising you, they knew about it. And they didn't sit down and say to you, you know what, what happened out there, and take, the, take your side all the time. What they did was they got you in the house and read you the riot act. And they didn't want to know the excuses. They just read you the riot act and told you what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. People were more afraid of their parents than they were of the police when I was growing up. I mean, I, I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't join a gang or commit a, an offense, not because I was afraid of the police. I was afraid to go home to my mother. I knew I was, that, that was it. Well, today it's the opposite. The parents are afraid of the kids. There's no parenting. There's no schooling. People just, there's, there's really no mentoring going on. And that's another thing. We need to have more mentoring from people like me, from people like you, Tom, from people like Susan, from those of you who, are, who have made it and who are professionals back in the community to show our kids that, you know what, you can actually make it. You, there, there's another side of life other than that gang culture. Uh, so I think that the only way we're going to stop the gang culture is that we go back into our communities and start parenting start being neighbors to our neighbors, uh, and start taking all of this very seriously, and we're not. Instead, what we do is we see the problem, and we move away from the problem. And you, you're going to keep moving, but it's, that problem's going to keep moving along with you at some point in time until we all kind of stop and say, let's do something about it. And we recognize it. You have to recognize it. You cannot be in denial. If you're in denial, we're never going to solve the problem. And a lot of people in our neighborhoods are in denial of what we as a community lack, and that is uh, the moral fiber of taking care of our kids. It's just not having a kid, it's actually raising that kid in the proper way. And we're just not doing that. And we need to really start doing that. By the way, Danette referred to Susan Yu, who was my law firm partner, and they both sit on the LA County Bar uh, Judicial Evaluation Commission, which evaluates people applying to be judges. Um, and uh, all Susan does is rave about it. Annette Meyer's character, her integrity, her intelligence. That's all I hear at the office. So I <laughs> um, Danette, um, a couple of years ago, I was on a radio show with Dr. Alvin Passant, who was an African-American professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. And he had written a somewhat controversial book with Bill Cosby to the black community suggesting stop looking uh, to be victims, empower yourself, take responsibility. And it, it generated some controversy. And he was talking about this on the radio show. And uh, I said to him, uh, Dr. Passant, while we're speaking, uh, hundreds of felons, thousands of felons are being released from state prison. They have felony convictions. Uh, they are given a suit of clothes, a few hundred dollars, and they're dropped in their community. Tell me how they survive tonight and tomorrow night. Tell me how you think they should empower themselves. You didn't have an answer. What do you think of that? I think that, and that's a, that's a good point, because we're going to see more and more uh, like that. That's one of the uh, issues, the problems with AB 109, the realignment, because we're going to start letting people out of the Department of Corrections, 
uh, who have absolutely no skills. Uh, I think, and I've always said this, that we give uh, inmates who enter the Department of Corrections and even the county jail system, we give them this, con this thing called good time work time. And you can sit on your duff in the county jail and the Department of Corrections and do absolutely nothing, and you're going to get good time work time credits. I think that's ridiculous. Inside of both the county jail system and the Department of Corrections, they need to again start the rehabilitation process. It used to be 20 years ago, you know, part of punishment was both, uh, sentencing was both punishment and rehabilitation. And they struck out rehabilitation some time ago, which I thought was the most ridiculous thing in the world because what you're saying to people is, do your time in county jail, do your time in the Department of Corrections, and we're not going to rehabilitate you. We're going to give you $200 a suit and you go back in the community and, face your, and, and do what you can. Well, if you didn't have the equipment to do it before you got there, you're certainly not going to have the equipment to do it after. My suggestion is, in the Department of Corrections, if you want to earn good time work time credits, then actually provide something that can be characterized as good time work time credits, meaning give people more of an opportunity to get a college education in the Department of Corrections. You can do it online. Give them those, that opportunity. Uh, have more people come in from the community to talk about rehabilitation. Uh, in the Department of Corrections and in the county jail system. Talk about how, what you're going to face when you get out into the system. You know, job skills, again, not everybody is equipped to go to college, but we all have some skill. You know, uh, whether you're a plumber, whether you are, uh, you, you're a roofer, or something manual, manually that you can do with your hands, which are great jobs, teach people how to do these jobs. Uh, you know, there's always the option of providing the military, I think, should open up. If you've got nonviolent offenders with felony convictions, the military should open up and say, you know what, we provide this kind of a program where we can give you discipline, we can also give you an education, and we can show you a trade. Then the person is equipped to do something in life. So you're absolutely right. I mean, saying it without the, the, the equipment and, 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 and everything that you need is not very helpful, but we need, as a society, need to provide that. And I think we have a very good opportunity now with AB 109 to do something like that. There's a little bit of money there. Give the money out to the providers so that they can provide those kinds of rehabilitative services to people who actually need it. Job training programs. I have to tell you, I remember when I graduated from high school, uh, I had a job. There were all of these job training programs out there. Now, I know most of them have been cut. Uh, by the federal government, but they were out there. I mean, I learned how to type, I learned how to, how to actually work in an office because there were job training programs out there. But if you don't know how to work, how to act in the side of an office because you never had a job, uh, it's not going to miraculously come to you at some point in life. You have to be trained to do those kinds of things. So we as a society, we really kind of need to go back in and think about this. Uh, do we always want our taxes cut? Because look, let's face it, in order to have those kinds of problems, that programs, you're going to have to increase taxes because there needs to be money out there. And so I think that we all need to take that step and say, you know what, this is something better for society. Uh, we've gotten away from what is better for society, and all of us have gotten more into what is better for me and how much money I can put in my pocket, as opposed to, as a society, how can we be better as a society? And I think it's just going to, be, it's going to cost. So you're right, but those, my solution is more programs uh, inside where, while people are being incarcerated, so they have the time on their hands to do it, and then you give them a benefit by saying, okay, if you get that bachelor's degree, or if you get that high school diploma, you're going to get more time credits, you're going to get out faster. That's the incentive for people who are incarcerated. <coughs> Plain and simple. Now, Danette, I've noticed through the years that people will come to free clinics in South LA, and a young person was convinced to plead to a misdemeanor, juvenile court to check out. They were told it's no brainer, no big deal, it's a misdemeanor. And then they wake up and they can't get into college, they can't get a college scholarship, they can't get a license if they want to be a nurse or an investigator or a realtor, um, uh, they have trouble getting to law school if they want to do that. Do you have any thoughts about that, that whole problem? That is a, uh, that's a really, the, the problem is, is, going, is ongoing and it's unfortunate. Uh, if you're a juvenile, you should remember to always get your records sealed because if you get those records sealed, then that's not going to be a problem for you because when you, when you have them, they can't get into them as a juvenile. Uh, when you become an adult, uh, it is a huge problem uh, and I say to people all the time, 
make sure that you take advantage of Penal Code Section, I believe it's 1203.4, which is the expungement uh, provision, which allows you to go in and try to get it off your records. If it's a misdemeanor, you can get it off your records and you don't have to. Cer certain misdemeanors you may have to, but if it's a misdemeanor, you can get it off your record. Certain felonies, again, you have to tell your employer, you know what, it was expunged. So, um, you know, employers have the right to do it if they're going to employ you. It's, I mean, there should be something there that certain felonies and certain mis and most misdemeanors you shouldn't be able to look into, but they can, the, the result is they can. So that's why I say to people all the time, if you're charged with a misdemeanor offense or a felony offense, get a lawyer to help you down the way because uh, it will impact you greatly now, uh, unfortunately. Um, as I said before, when I applied to the University of California, I don't think anybody ran my rap sheet. I think the first time I had somebody go into my rap sheet was when I became a DA, and they ran my rap sheet. But other than that, no one ever did. They just never cared. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. It's unfortunate. Maybe some legislation down the line to protect students would be helpful, um, particularly young people. Because I think that when you're 20 and you commit stupid things, stupid crimes, by the time you're 40, you realize what you've done. You know, even when you're 30, you're thinking to yourself, why did I do something so stupid? Because it does impact you greatly. Uh, your credit, I think that there needs to be some legislation where they don't look at that on certain offenses. Now, certain violent offenses, absolutely they need to look at that. Because civilly down the line, it may hurt. If that person is convicted of a violent offense and commits another violent offense, if the employer knew it, should have been charged with knowing it, that employer is looking at a lot of civil liability down the line. So I can see that part of it. But the other stupid stuff, you know, I don't know. Any other questions from anyone? Yes. Who decides where the uh, case would be adjudicated, whether it's in uh, the airport or Pomona, as you were saying, because, uh, you know. It's where you commit your offense. So, if so you don't have a airport, choice. You know, yeah, if you're, if you're in the uh, West District, okay, and you go down in the West District over there in Target and you commit your offense over there, we're going to get it in, in, at the airport. If you go down to Compton and you commit an offense, it goes to the Compton Court. Mona. So it's all where you commit your offense, that's where you're going to be charged. That's what I thought, now, because the, you don't have a choice in terms right. of now, whether you got that. The caveat is that like, the, some of the cases, most of the cases that I try, uh, which are all murder cases, at the airport they get sent downtown, because the airport doesn't have the facility to try those long-term murder cases. So sometimes, even though you commit the offense, depending on the, the kind of offense, like for instance, uh, death penalty cases, largely they go to the ninth floor uh, downtown because some of the outlining branch courts can't handle them. The airport, they tried one death case. I did that one, and it happened, uh, I think, two years ago. We tried it, and I begged and begged to keep it at the airport. Uh, so they kept it at the airport. But most of them go downtown. Can you mention um, what, in my opinion, is a successful live-in uh, program that offers a sliding scale for uh, adolescents as well as adults? Yeah. Would that be appropriate? So, so. It's a, it's a, a live-in uh, treatment program that offers parenting classes and job training and has a sliding scale for adolescents. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it, as well as uh, adults. Is it appropriate for me to mention that program? Uh, that would be on top. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Dream Center, which is in Echo Park. Um, I, a lot of people aren't aware of it. and. Uh, my understanding was the courts were initially not allowed to recommend it as an option, but because of their high success rate, that has been changing. Now, most of the programs at the court will, when you go into court and you say, you know, I want my client to um, enter into a drug treatment program or a mental health facility, the courts have programs that they, uh, have, they decide are appropriate, uh, and they have a list of them. Some of them, uh, are not on the list, and, and largely, if they're not on the list, the judges will not acknowledge them, and they will not allow the, the uh, defendants to, to enter into those programs. So usually, the programs that uh, people go into come from a list that have been have been approved by the Superior Court. I don't know if that one has been approved or not. My understanding was um, because um, the basis of this particular program being a faith-based program, it was. Uh, I, as I understand it, not allowed to be recommended, but if the, uh, the attorneys suggest it, then uh, it's a viable option. If, if the judge says, even though you know, there are some programs where 
that are not on the approved list of the Superior Court. And I have seen judges say, well, you know what, that program seems to me to be okay, and they will approve that program on their own. So you're absolutely right about that. But generally speaking, when you have a program, whether it's a mental health program or an outpatient drug treatment program, uh, it, it's on an approved list by the, the Supreme, by the Superior Court of LA County, and usually the judges will go off that particular list. You should also know that in, in most of the courts, I know we have it at the airport, there is an individual in the airport court who can facilitate uh, getting clients, getting people into programs. Uh, and the public defenders use this person all the time. So if you go and you don't, you're not familiar with the person, if you go up to the public defender in any one of the courts and say, uh, who are you using to recommend certain programs? This person always is also able to get people into beds. So you can go to them and say, who's the person to see if they can help. Uh, one of the biggest problems Los Angeles County has right now is they don't have enough beds. So there's a waiting list for people to get into, in, uh, uh, to get into residential drug treatment programs. Uh, and a lot of times judges get so frustrated because the individual cannot get into the uh, program that they go ahead and impose jail time. They're, they're like, you know what, I don't have time to deal with this, and they impose the jail time. Uh, a number of times what you find is people are awaiting uh, beds while they're in the county jail. So for instance, they know they're probably going to state prison, and their lawyer is looking for a bed for them in a drug treatment program. If they can't find the bed, they may, may end up in the Department of Corrections. Uh, so they're wait, awaiting their time in the county jail so a bed can open up for them. That's a real, real big problem in LA County. We just don't have the money to facilitate the, all the needs that we have. Because the bottom line is, my view is, the last 10 years of practicing in the criminal justice system, most of the crimes that I see on a day-to-day -day basis, not the, the murder cases that happen as a result of domestic violence or those that happen just as a result of people being evil, and man's inhumanity to man. But by and large, the big chunk of cases, the person, if you look into their record, it's always drugs or alcohol. I can tell you right now, it, it, it's always that. Uh, at some point in their life, uh, there is an addiction to something like that, which causes them to act out. And, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate, uh, because the way we deal with it in this society is, You've got an alcohol or a drug program a problem, you don't deal with that problem, you come into the criminal justice system, and we don't treat it a lot of times, and then that person, their crimes just escalate and escalate and escalate. What I mean escalate, they may end up starting off being petty thieves, uh, then they go into state prison as a result of possession of narcotics, then they come out and they've got to rob somebody, and it just escalates and escalates. And their lives are just, just you know, it, it's turmoil, and there's nothing really we can do. The problem is we have the lack of facilities, we don't recognize the problem, we don't have the facilities to treat the problems. Because again, we don't have the money. Um, dollars are tight now. So they're not going to programs like that. And they probably ought to go to programs like that because in the long run, so we're, all, we're all very short-sighted, but in the long run, uh, it's only gonna help us. We see, where, we see how we've dealt with the problem for the last 15 years. And I think that we can all agree that the performance has been poor. It really has been. We haven't addressed the, the needs and the problems. So now it's just going to take a lot of people with a lot of insight and understanding and compassion to say, we're going to have to do something different. And with respect to drugs and alcohol, I really think society, we have to treat it differently because we're not working on the problem. Any other questions? Anyone? Well, listen, we've been it, How can I contact you at a later date? Um, stand outside and say, hey. <laughs> um, you can contact me. My office number is 310-727-6537. And you can always call me, leave me a message. I get back to you. Uh, but understand, I, I, I run from downtown to the airport, but I'll eventually get back to you and call me anytime if you've got a question or something like that. And people do. They call me a lot uh, if they've got a question. 310-727-6537. I can't always help you. I can, let me just tell you right now. If you call me about a pending case that you have, my standard answer is going to be um, you have a lawyer. I cannot talk to you if you are a defendant in a criminal case because you have a lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer, you need to get a lawyer. You don't want to talk to me. Have your lawyer call me. Okay? Have your lawyer call me and, um, and I can direct you to whatever you need to, directions to. If you're calling me just about a general problem, 
you know, where do I go for this? Where do I go for that? I'll, I'll call you back and say, this is, for instance, if you want to know a health care provider, I'll call you and say, okay, this is a court approved list. This is what you can do. That I can do for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.